Well, good morning, church. First Chronicles 16, 23 says, Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. I sure hope that you've been proclaiming it in your own life. And uh, I hope you've come ready to worship this morning. We've got a great morning planned ahead as our worship team will be leading us this morning in a, a message from Dr. Mikey. So why don't you join me as I open us in prayer. Father God, we just pause right now. We just say thank you for another Sunday. Thank you that we're here. Thank you that we're family. Lord, we know that we have been in a crazy time the last couple of months. And I know many of us have just tried to process and figure out how to uh, cope and navigate during this season. So Father, would you just um, help us to just take our mind off of all those things here for this next hour. And I pray that we'll worship you as a family, Lord, in our living rooms and wherever we may be found. I pray, God, that we'll give what is rightfully yours. Lord, that we'll proclaim your salvation day after day, even in these days and even more in these days. We love you and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you join us as we worship? coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break and every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Sing, so open up the gates, so open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God is coming to save, our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord all my signature? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. Every knee will bow before Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Every knee will bow before Him I love this church, who can stop the Lord Almighty Let's sing it. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Sing it again, church. Who can stop? Who can stop the Lord Almighty?
How many of you believe one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord, the promised Lamb of God? Let's sing together. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place, there's a place of streams of grace for deep and wide. Of all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing. Surrender my life, I am in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe to you. I owe to you, Jesus. There's a place. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. Where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. All the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down at the cross. everything to Jesus. He is mighty to save. Let's sing. 
everyone is compassion love that's never failed then mercy fall on me everyone is forgiveness the kindness of a savior the hope of nature Forever, author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me. So take me as you find all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Now I surrender. Sing a church, say, Lord, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered, shine your light, shine your light. Let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Savior, he can move the mountains Yes, he can. Oh, my God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God, my God. conquered one more time he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ he conquered the grave it is by his amazing grace that he has saved us we didn't deserve it as Paul said he freely gives to us grace upon grace. Let's sing together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now was blind but now I see Twas grace Twas grace that taught my heart to fall And grace 
is my fears really how precious did thy grace appear the hour I first be. my chains are gone my chains are gone I Has promised. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope secures. He will my shield and portion me as long as life. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And my God's blood, His mercy reigns on any love. Amazing. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. I will set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And my God's blood, His mercy reigns unending love. Amazing. together the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be be forever mine will be forever mine claiming this morning you are forever mine you are forever mine thank you father that you freely gave us the gift of your son who is a perfect sacrifice for us. It was only by your grace. We didn't deserve it. We don't deserve it even now. But God, you choose to freely give upon us grace upon grace through the form of your son who came as a servant, the word says. He served. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So, Lord Jesus, we say this morning, thank you for your sacrifice for us. Thank you for your grace. Father, I pray that you would preach through Dr. Mikey this morning. I pray that everything that is spoken is your word. And, Father, I pray that we would apply it to our lives in every way so that we can be more like your son, Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.
Good morning, Broadway Baptist Church. It is so good to be with you today. What a joy it is to celebrate, once again, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we come together as a body of believers. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a wonderful time of worshiping with you so far, with music and, of course, giving of tithes and offerings, and just hearing about what's going on at Broadway Baptist Church. We know that this is a different style of worship, for us right now, but we look forward to getting back together very soon. So let's begin today with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for just another great opportunity for us to worship you. We might be in our homes. We might be separated from one another in a sense, but Lord God, we are one family. We have one Lord. We have one body, and we truly, truly have one spirit because in Christ Jesus, we are one. So thank you, Lord God, for all that we have. I pray for those who are tuning in today. I pray for those who are watching. I I pray that you would work in their lives in a special way, as you already have in my life, as I've looked at this message and examined it closely. And my hope today is that we would be careful in this world as we walk and live as Christians, that we would be aware of the things that are out there that you've told us and instructed us to be careful about. So Lord God, give us wisdom today. Give us great understanding and teach us, Lord God, with the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, have you ever seen this sign before? Beware of dog. You probably have. Um, a lot of people put this up to be a deterrent for certain people. But I came across a story years ago, and I thought it was so funny. A stranger had entered into a country store, and as he was walking into in the front door, he sees a sign on the front door, and it says, Beware of Dog. And uh, it says danger on it, of course, you know. And um, as it's posted there on the door, he walks in, and he's looking around, and he sees an old, old, old hound dog lying there on the floor in front of the cash register. And he couldn't help but laugh at it, right? He just looked, he said, surely that's, that's not the dog. So he, he asked the person behind the register, who was actually the store owner, said, um, is that the dog that I'm supposed to be aware of? And the owner said, yep, that's him. And the stranger laughed a little bit and he said, I, I cer that certainly doesn't look like a dangerous dog to me. Why in the world would you post a sign like that? And the stranger, uh, the strangers kind of laughed and said, well, what are you doing? And the owner looked back at him and said, well, before I posted that sign, people kept tripping over that dog all the time. Now we don't have as many falls as we used to. I think that's so funny, right? It, it's so interesting when we really think about how a dog could bring harm to us. It may not be a vicious dog. It may not be a dog that's just trying to protect the owner or trying to protect the store. It might just be a dog lying on the floor, but that dog that's lying on the, fall, on the floor could be a danger. Dogs don't always bite, but they can hurt us in many ways. I think that's interesting, right? When we think about that, we, 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 we're always looking for the worst, um, the worst aspect of danger or uh, the worst idea of danger. And that's what we try to warn people about. But what about those subtle distractions? What about those things that get us that we're not even uh, really, that we don't even really realize or notice right away? I wanna share with you a message today that I've entitled, Beware of Religious Pitfalls. And this is a significant passage found in Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And Paul, in this wonderful letter to the church at Philippi, he's explaining to them that they need to be careful or beware of pitfalls that are out there. And I'm going to look at three pitfalls today that I think it's easy for any of us, even in the Christian world, because we know that the letter of Philippians was written to a group of Christians, a group of believers, right? And we, as we looked at last week, it was the first Christian church in Europe. And that's why a lot of people would call Lydia, who we looked at last week on Mother's Day, as being the person who is the mother of the first Christian church in, in Europe, which I just think is fascinating in and of itself. But I want you to see in the middle of this letter, there's something very important. And it's this, uh, it's this admonishment, this, this warning that the Apostle Paul gives. He said, you need to be careful, beware of false teachers, beware of false teaching, and beware of false security. And he's telling them it's easy to fall into these areas, even as a Christian, but be careful about these things. Now, I, 
I want you to just think for just a moment about the whole idea of a pitfall. And I want to show you an illustration here of a pitfall. And it can get anybody, right? Here is a lady that's walking down the street. Now, she doesn't see that the cellar on the sidewalk or the basement on the sidewalk is open. She doesn't see it. Why? Because she's on her phone right? She is on her phone. This is what we call distracted walking. We have distracted driving with people on their cell phones, but this is distracted walking. And do you know, she fell right into this cellar. She fell right into this and got hurt. Here's a couple of ladies that see her falling into there and they don't know what to do. They go and, and reach for her and all that kind of thing. But, but she fell in. And the reason that she fell in is because she was distracted by something as simple as the cell phone. She took her eyes off of where she was going and she fell into something. You know, there's a great point in this for us, right? Because we can look at this and we might, uh, we might laugh a little bit because she turned out okay and, and she had some, she was definitely bruised and banged up, but she got out of there and she was okay. And we can see that type of thing happen. But, but one of the things that's important for us Christians is that we need to be careful of the pitfalls that are out there for us. We might just be living the Christian life and thinking, oh, nothing would happen to us. But the next thing you know, we're falling into some kind of trap set by the devil himself or set by the world. You know, the world has a way of tempting us. And the Bible tells us in 1 John, do not love the world or the things of the world. The, the flesh might love these things, but you got to be careful because they'll pull you in to a life of suffering, a life of pain, a life of regret. And the Bible says, beware of these types of things. There are pitfalls even for those who are walking uprightly with the Lord. And I've heard this from a very uh, young age, but um, I, it's been something that's come back around every maybe couple of years. Satan seems to go after those who are really serving him, serving the Lord. Satan usually goes after those people. He's trying to tear them down. He's trying to destroy the reputation. He wants to uh, annihilate them completely. You know, Satan hates everybody. He does, there's nobody he loves. So in that, he, he, hates the, he hates the Christian, he hates the Catholic, he hates the, um, the, the Mormon, the Jehovah's Witness, he hates the atheist, he hates all people. He's a, he's a liar, father of lies, and he, could, he wouldn't want anything more. He, he couldn't hope for anything more than for you just to fall, just to fall on your face spiritually, fall on your face emotionally, fall on your face physically. He would love that. And so the Apostle Paul says, beware of the pitfalls that are out there that can so take your life. And I want you to look with me in the book of Philippians, of course, in Philippians chapter three, and we're gonna look at seven verses here. It says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord to, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evil doers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever I gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. I want you to look at that verse seven with me because it is so meaningful in this entire passage. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So I had all of this. I had everything you could ever want, Paul's saying, but I count it as loss. I count it as rubbish compared to the relationship that I have with Jesus Christ. And that's what he's talking about in Philippians chapter three. He said, I, I have it all. I have the resume of resumes. I have it, but I count all that as loss compared to the, the, the surpassing greatness of Jesus Christ and the relationship that I have with him. Now, when we think about this passage, 
we've got to put in context what he's really talking about. Living by the flesh. Now, we see this in the book of Galatians. It's all over the place in that book. And, of course, we see it also in Romans. But what do we know uh, about the flesh? We know these things. You can't be saved by the flesh. We are saved by the Spirit. We are saved by our faith in the Lord God Almighty. We are saved by the Word of God. We're not saved by any works or actions. If any work is, uh, we're saved by any work, it's the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's not by us. It's by what Christ did on the cross. So we're not saved by our works in the flesh. No one can be saved. If we could, we could boast about it. But the Bible says no one is saved that way. You can't live the Christian life in the flesh either. It's impossible. We can try all day long, but if we're not living by the Spirit or Spirit-led and we're living by the flesh, we will never accomplish anything that's of eternal value, of course, looking at what Christ has done because Christ is the one that works in and through us. Now, I've said this many times. I think I've said this once or twice at Broadway Baptist Church, but, but I look at it this way. All the good that's in me is what Christ has put there. And all the good that I do is what Christ is doing through me. Because if I say, look what I've done, it's an accomplishment of my flesh. And there is no value in that. I can't do anything on my own. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. Praise the Lord for the word Emmanuel, the title of God, Emmanuel, God with us. If God wasn't for us, every we would fall to everything. See, if God's not for us, really, if God's not for us, all of our enemies would take us out. That's just, that's biblical, right? But if God be for us, who can rise up against us? Who can come up against us? You can't be a godly church member in the flesh. We can try all day long to say, hey, I, I do all the things I'm supposed to do. I try to meet all the, the needs of the church. That are, I'm, I'm there. The door Every time the doors are open, I'm always there when called upon. I put so much time in. I, I remember um, I had a, a great friend of mine who, who we were part of a church together. I was on staff at the church and and he was working uh, at the church. He was in the, the media aspect of the church. And so both working at the same church, but he would tell me all the time, you know, I haven't missed a Sunday. I haven't missed church. I haven't missed a Sunday in over 10, 11 years. And I looked at him and I said, that's incredible. He said, yep, yep, it is incredible. You see, um, you see God's gonna take in those things to, into account. Well, I think he's right. But if he's holding on to that attendance, that perfect attendance, that attendance record for his uh, right standing with God, he's missed it. Because our right standing with God is not because we are somewhere physically. It's because we're with the Lord uh, emotionally and, of course, spiritually. That's the only way that we're going to be right with God in all things. Next, you can't be a godly spouse or parent in the flesh. There's a lot of parents in the world today who are trying to parent their children. I'm talking about Christians, trying to parent their children by means of the flesh. Uh, they're trying to be parents just by living uh, by the way of the flesh. They're, they're trying to just set rules and standards and, and, and this idea of ethics, but it's bigger than that. It's about a right standing with God. What was the commandment that the children of Israel, the parents in the children of Israel, were supposed to give to their kids to love the Lord their God with all their hearts and mind and strength and love their neighbor as their self? That was the command. It was to teach the kids about God, to train them who God is, tell them who God is, and then they will know how to live and how to act. And then also, of course, when we look at it, and that last point there was about being a godly worker about someone. You can't be a godly worker uh, by means of the flesh. It's impossible. So we look at those types of things. But in this first point that I want to give you, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear that we need to beware of false teachers. And so let's get into this lesson. It says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. So he's saying here right at the beginning uh, there in, in verse 1, to write these things to you, it's no trouble for me. It's not a, tr it's no trouble. When, when we're sharing the gospel with people, it shouldn't be of any trouble to us. When we're training people in godliness, it should not be of any trouble to us. 
because it's of eternal value. It's something that we're empowered to do. I was so grateful to have a dear friend of mine. His name's uh, Brother Jim, and and um, Jim was a was a man, or is a man who just truly walks with the Lord. Uh, he reads the Bible all the time. He's a person who's always willing to help you whenever you're in need. He's a deacon. He's been a minister as well. He's done a lot of things in the church world. And I'm so grateful for Brother Jim. But one of the things that Jim told me that I have held on to for a long time, he said, when I am right with the Lord and I am doing the work of the Lord, I don't feel tired whatsoever. I feel empowered. I feel strengthened. He's 70 in his early 70s and said, I feel as, as strong as I was when I was in my 20s to go out there and do what I need to do, especially when I know it's in the will of God. I think there's something special in that because the Apostle Paul is saying, this is not trouble for me. I'm not worn out doing this. I'm empowered to do what I'm doing. I'm empowered to tell you to be careful about the teachers that are out there, those false teachers. This is not a problem for me to write to you. I love you. I care about you. And I want the best for you. And I want you to be safe. And that's what he's talking about there. But then he gets into verse two. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Look out for those people. They, they will hurt you as quickly as they possibly can. I came in across another funny story about, uh, about an old hound dog laying in a yard, right? And uh, an, over man, an old man in overalls was sitting on his porch and, and this dog was just lying out there in the yard in front of him. And this stranger comes up and says, excuse me, sir, but does your dog bite as he was about to come up to the front steps? And the, and the stranger uh, was asking this question. He was just very curious about the dog. And the old man replied, nope, my dog doesn't bite. The tourist stepped out of the car, the stranger stepped out of the car, the dog ran over snarling, growling, and bit the man on the arm and then on his legs. And he quickly got away and the dog ran off. And that tourist, that stranger came back up to the older man that was sitting there in that, uh, on that porch and he said, man, I thought you said your dog didn't bite. And the old man said, that ain't my dog. I think that's kind of great when you think about the story, right? It's not his dog. Now, did he probably know that dog would bite? Yeah. But you know, this is exactly the way that some people are in the world. They will let you go into a pitfall. They will allow you to step out of a car and get bitten by some kind of animal because, hey, ain't my animal. Man, ain't on me. We need to be so careful about that. We need to be people who warn people about the pitfalls that are out there and help them to stay out of it themselves, right? We too need to be careful lest we be tempted and fall into some kind of pitfall as well. And of course, uh, the book of Galatians explains that to us um, in, in great detail. But I want you to see here what, what we're saying about false prophets and false teachers. In Matthew seven fifteen, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They can look like the best of the best, but they really are just wolves in sheep's clothing. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. As I said earlier, Satan hates you and he wants to destroy your life. You need to be careful. He's going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And then 2 Corinthians 11, it reads, For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Satan is known as being an angel uh, that, uh, that disguises himself, right? He is, a, he is the devil who disguises himself in such a way that he looks inviting, but he is the deceiver. He is the, he, he is the adversary. He's the one that comes against you. He is your enemy. And so we need to be careful about this. So beware of false teachers. Now, the false teachers that he's referring to in the book of Philippians um, and even the book of Galatians, uh, really it's coming down to this main group, the Judaizers, also called the circumcision group. 
And the Apostle Paul calls them the dogs, the evildoers, the mutilators of the flesh. They're all about the idea of you going and cutting yourself or a male cutting himself so that he can be right with God. That's the whole point. And the Apostle Paul says that is not going to fix uh, any of the issues that we have spiritually because that's works of the flesh. That's an action of the flesh. It is not it is not a spiritual action. It is not a spiritual belief or faith. It has all to do with uh, some kind of work, uh, some kind of action of the flesh. They accepted the apostolic t- uh, preaching about Christ, uh, these Judaizers, but added the circumcision and practice of Jewish ceremonial laws for salvation. The Judaizers did not want to be persecuted by uh, by traditional Jews. This is what they wanted to, to stay away from. So they said the way that we can stay clean and stay out of trouble with the traditional Jews is if we hold to the circumcision and the ceremonial laws. Now, we can believe other things, maybe about Christ, but we got to make sure that we stick to this. And of course, Paul comes against them completely. Why? Because they were opponents or the enemy of Paul's preaching. They came against him and they, as he would say, preached another gospel. They preached another gospel. So the question I have for you, is the gospel sufficient for you? Of course, it should be, right? The gospel is enough. It's not uh, uh, you're saved by faith and works. You're saved by faith in Jesus Christ, right? You're saved by grace through faith. It's not of our own doing or we could boast. Jewish Christians sought to induce Gentiles to observe Jewish religious customs or to Judaize. And this is what they were trying to do. They were trying to get these Gentiles to come into that same type of thinking. And Paul said, if you've heard these people speak, if you've talked to them in some way, beware. They are false teachers with a false message and run from them. Galatians 1.8 But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. He said there's no place in Christianity for this type of teaching. The gospel of Jesus Christ is exclusive. There's only one way, and it's through the person of Jesus Christ. It's not by actions. It's not by works of the flesh. It's by Jesus Christ alone. And how how does all that work? It's by us believing in Christ. It's by us putting our faith and trust in him, confessing that he is Lord and believing that God raised you from the dead. That's how we're saved. Now, I want you to see this also. You see in Matthew 18, verse six, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, I've been to Israel a couple of times, and, and I've definitely seen uh, this wine press. I actually believe that same wine press. I've seen um, this crushing of the grapes and all of that and crushing of olives, and they, they do all that with these, with these millstones. But I'm, I'm going to tell you this. That millstone right there is so heavy. Now, if you were just to try to tread water holding that, of course, you could never do it because it would take you down and take you down quickly to the bottom of the sea. And Jesus is making a statement here. He said, if any of you causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have this kind of millstone tied around his neck and cast into the sea. Now, what he's saying there is that I will not tolerate, I will not condone any actions where someone who believes in me is pulled away or deceived, and I will punish them. I will bring justice upon them. I will rightly judge them. And he's making that clear. Sometimes we we misrepresent Christ. You know, I, I heard growing up, and I, I don't know why I heard this or who actually put this in my head, but Jesus is love, 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 right? And, and we know that he is. God is love. We know that God is loving. We know that Christ is loving, obviously. But when it comes to sin, he is the righteous, the righteous judge. He is the perfect and holy judge. He doesn't let people just get away with sin. Sin, people, sinners are held accountable and they will see punishment for what they've done. And the only way a person can get away from that punishment or not have that punishment 
placed upon them is that they put their faith in Christ Jesus and they come into Christ and, and in Christ Jesus, he died, took our sins upon him on the cross, died. He went through the fullest of punishments, but in him, we are raised to walk a new life. So only in him, you can be protected from the true wrath of God, or even what we'd say is the justice of God, that perfect and righteous justice. So this is a great illustration that we need to be careful of course, the, the false teachers and the false prophets, they need to be careful and need to stop doing what they're doing. But at the same time, we need to be careful not to listen to them or get caught up in their uh, deceitfulness or, or their deceiving ways, okay? Next, beware of false teaching. Not just beware of the false teachers, right? But what is the message that can come from all different types of ways? And so we see in, um, in verses four through six, look what it reads. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. What? Look what it says there. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, and he says, and I have actually more confidence in the flesh or could have more confidence in the flesh because of the life that I have lived. And he goes through all these things, right? When you think, think about this, circumcised on the eighth day, this is truly a, a Jewish perspective there. He was doing, he was a good Jew in that fact. He was doing what he was called to do and what was instituted by God himself. Of course, it goes on to say he's of the people of Israel. When we think about the people of Israel, we are thinking of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, coming from these people, from the people that, that God has a unique covenant with. Then he goes on, the tribe of Benjamin. Judah and Benjamin were elite tribes. We see that, that uh, Benjamin was a child child of Rachel. And of course, an elite tribe, as I just said there before that, but, but this is a, a very special thing. The first king of the Israelites was from the tribe of Benjamin. So we're looking at a very elite tribe here, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Hebrew man. You know, if we start just kind of walking through these, just this whole idea of, of, of the apostle Paul, he was a person truly who was he, he had the resume of resumes. He was a person who um, no one had probably a more significant chance of being, uh, being saved by works of the flesh more than the Apostle Paul. And that's what he's saying. I, I could have complete confidence in the flesh and I held on to that. But he said there, but that's not, that's not where there's salvation he goes on, he says, I'm the, of the Hebrew of the Hebrews. This means that he was trained, trained by the best of the best in the, within the Hebrews. He was trained by or taught by Gamaliel, who was well known among the Jews as being a great Jewish teacher, a person at the highest level. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Not only was, was his training right, but his understanding of the law was perfect, right? He knew exactly what the law said. Many people think that the Apostle Paul had the Torah memorized, and, and probably he probably did. I mean, he knew it. He knew what the Word of God was saying. He didn't know what it fully meant, but he knew what it said at that time. He said, as a zeal... Uh, a persecutor of the church. He was zealous. A lot of people don't want to say this about the Apostle Paul, but I, I, I've got to say it. He was full of zeal for tearing down the Christian church. He would be called today a terrorist, truly a terrorist against Christians. We think about the Muslims today or radical Islam, and we think about these people and we say, all right, well, they are terrorists against the Christians a lot of times. They will kill anybody in their country, or they would kill anybody in their country that is a Christian. And you say, well, that's a terrorist. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. If you were a Christian, he would try to imprison you. He would make sure you were beaten, and he would try to have you killed. That was the whole point. He was zealous for destroying the Christian church. And then 
as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He followed the law as he knew it perfectly. He followed it. There was nothing that he was doing wrong. Nothing. But what's interesting in all of these points here that I think you have to take note of is that these are all of the flesh. It's all based on what family he was born in. It was based on what he's done uh, with his life, based on his training, the training that he had received. How far did he go with that training? To what extent was he willing to go um, to, to succeed in what he was doing? And you look at all those things, you say, okay, man, this guy, he was, he was just a religious fanatic. Yeah, exactly. He was religious to the point that he would kill people for it. You know, that's kind of inter interesting thought. Um, when you look at Baptist history, you know, Broadway Baptist Church, and we, we're so uh, grateful to be a part of a Baptist church. I don't know if you know a lot about the Baptist faith, but it's a few hundred years old, right? And there's something very unique about the Baptists. They come from a, a line of people that were pacifists. They came from a line of people who said, you know, we don't want to hurt people because of our faith. We want to love people because of our faith. But we're willing to suffer for our faith. We're not willing to kill for it, but we're willing to suffer. That's, that was Baptist beginnings for us. A lot of the Baptists, early Baptists, some of them were called Anabaptists, being baptized again because, um, because they were baptized as infants and then they are baptized later on as believers. And so they, they called themselves the Anabaptists, right? Or took on that name. But one of the things I want you to know about the Baptists, just in general, a lot of those Baptists early, early on uh, were drowned in water because people said, oh, you like the water? Oh, you want to be baptized again? Okay, well, we'll baptize you again. And they would drown them. This is how many of them died because they were willing to die for their faith. They were uh, pacifists in many ways. See, that's the opposite of what Paul was or what Saul, Saul, what he was before he became Paul, before he became a Christian. He was a radical, religious fanatic who would go out there and try to just kill uh, Christians. And so that's what's happening. He was really, let's just be honest, he was trying to succeed in the flesh. He was trying to conquer things and, and, and um, prosper in the flesh, but you can't, you can't do it. And so I think it kind of brings us back to a quote that I brought up uh, maybe in the last lesson or the one before that. I'm not afraid of failure, William Carey says. I'm afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. We hear this from D.L. Moody. We hear it from other people as well. We need to be careful to not succeed or put, put, um, put our success story or our story of, of prosperity into the idea of, of accomplishing it through actions of the flesh. Because if we, if we really just succeed in things that don't have eternal value to them, we're really failing at the things that matter. So we need to be careful in this. We need to be very careful. Also continuing on with the idea of false teaching. Whenever I've shared the gospel with people, I want you to know I've, I've had all kinds of responses. I want to give you some of these, and you might have said these before in your life. Um, and you might have heard these before as well, but we need to be careful because some of these responses are not really gospel responses. And I want you to see this. Common responses to the gospel when shared. I've been a member of First Baptist Church for 50 years. And so some people will say that makes me a Christian because I've been a member of a church. But that's not that's just an accomplishment of the flesh. That's not really a spiritual success that we have with Jesus Christ. That's not a, a life in Christ. That's being a member. That's having your name on the roll. My mother carried me to church before I was born. I've heard that many times. You know, I, I, I've been part of church before I was even born. Well, that doesn't make you a Christian just because you have been drugged to church, possibly <laughs> dragged, but you know what I mean by drug, right? But, but the idea there is that uh, just because you're being pulled into the church setting doesn't mean you're a believer. I was baptized when I was five years old. Do you know how many people I have rebaptized in my life? Rebaptized. 
they had a they had maybe an experience when they were young. They went and they were baptized. They felt like it was the right thing to do. And they realized later on in their life, I don't know. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know. I didn't know what it meant to be a Christian. I was just doing what I saw everybody else doing. And uh, I possibly just heard some kind of message that scared me. So I thought, you know what? I just ought to do this. Just be careful. But they never had a relationship with Christ. They'd never been trained in, in what it means to be a Christian. And so I heard this. And so uh, I've heard that many times. And, and I actually had the opportunity to lead people to Christ and to baptize them a second time. Um, I've worked with ministers who told me, man, this this is my, th my third time um, not ministers, but ministers at that time, they told me about experiences they had when they were younger. They actually said, you know, uh, they said, this is my third time. I, I got baptized three times. And um, and the third time was the right time. It's when I really had given my life to Christ. And uh, and so and then God, God called them into the ministry. And that's why I said they're ministers. So kind of interesting there. I've been a deacon for years. Oh, okay. Right. I mean, that's that's an awesome title. And that's one of those things where you're endorsed by the church. But do you really know Christ? Do you really know Christ? God knows my heart. This is probably one of the number one answers I have received when sharing the gospel, uh, and especially in the South. Oh, me and Jesus, you know, he knows me. He knows my heart. He knows that might not be a great thing. <laughs> Because if he knows your heart and our heart is deceitful and wicked, but if we are not right with the Lord God Almighty and we're not doing what he's called us to do and we're not following the commandments of God, do we really know him? Do we really know him? So we've got to be, beware of false teaching that's out there. God knows our heart and we need to be, we need to understand what, what the Bible says about God knowing our heart and what the Bible says about our response to the Lord God Almighty. Because if we're not doing it the way God's called us to do, my friends, we're in danger of not knowing God at all. So beware of false teaching and beware. Let, warn other people about it too. Because just, just because you're a member of a church or people are members of churches or just because their parents were members of churches or they were baptized at a young age or whatever it might be, that doesn't mean that they're in right relationship with the Lord. That doesn't mean they're a child of God. They need to know the gospel. You know why? Because if they're not careful, they might have a false security. And that's the third thing. Beware of false security, false securities. Philippians 3, 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He talks about this gain that he had, right? And this gain that he has, he's talking about profit. He's talking about success. I had all this profit. At least I thought I did. I had all this success. At least I thought I did. But what was it? What was it? Paul was born into an elite family with elite rights and elite privileges. He's privileged. He's Jewish and the gospel came first to the Jews. The word of God. Actually, the book, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, the Jew has the advantage because the prophets were Jews. The priests were Jews. The disciples were Jews. Jesus is a Jew. The word of God came to the Jews. They had the advantage. He came from all of that. But he was lost. He was completely lost without Jesus Christ in his life. He had all these things but no true peace with God. And that wasn't until the road to Damascus. You know, I think of false, a false sense of security. Think of these kinds of illustrations, right? These, these kinds of pictures. Here's a bike and this guy has, has locked it up, you know, chained it up to this post. But okay, that's not real security. As you can tell, you can just pull that right off there. Um, another one, hey, I made sure the lock was shut, you know, and, and, and it was all locked up. Yeah, but the latch wasn't on it right, you know, false sense of security. Another one of those is just the whole idea of, of, of computers. We get on computers all the time, everything we do, banking, everything, that correspondence, all that stuff seems to be completely online these days, right? And so how safe are we really? You post things online, can people turn those things against you? Absolutely. 
right? So we can have a, we have this false sense of security sometimes when we get out there and do these things, but, but it's not necessarily there. And so we need to be careful making sure that we do what the Bible says and have security in Christ, this eternal form of security. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 reads, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Here, here are a group of people, right, who have prophesied in the name of Jesus Christ casting out demons in the name of Jesus, doing all kinds of mighty works, which are miracles. That means Satan and his demons, they can work miracles, which is just wild to think of that. But then he's going to say to them, I never knew you. Why? Because they never surrendered their life over the Lord. Never. The Bible says the demons believe. The demons are orthodox, if you want to put it that way. They have the right thinking, the right knowledge, the right understanding of who God is, but that doesn't mean they've given their lives over to him or follow his commands. Not, not at all. And so we got to be careful of a false security because we've been around or seen things. Do we know Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior? I think one of the great uh, stories to look at in the Bible is the rich young ruler. And I just want to read through that story. It's not very long, but I think it's so appropriate for us. He comes to Jesus and we see in Matthew 19, verses 16 through 18. And behold, a man came to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. He goes on to say, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell, your, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You know, the, great, the, the problem there with this rich young ruler or the issue is that it says he had great possessions. And what that means is, is that he held on to what he had. He kept owning what he had. He wouldn't let it go. Does this mean that uh, for a person to become a Christian, they need to sell everything they have? No, that's what was holding this man back. What is it? Is there anything holding you back from following the Lord Jesus Christ? It says here, if you would be perfect, what that means, and, and don't get caught up in the word perfect there, but what this really is saying, and it's Jewish, this teaching here is Jewish. If you want to be right, if you want to be right with the Lord, ultimately is what he's saying, go. What you need to do is sell your, what you possess and give it to the poor because you're holding on to it. It is your idol. It is what you worship. And he said, because it's your idol, it's what you worship. God cannot be on the throne. So you got to gotta let go of it. You got to let go of it. And I think it's a great question here to ask, or a great time to ask a question. Is there something in your life that you've made an idol that you would put up before God? I don't know what it might be. It could be anything. It could be, it could be as simple as the things that you stream on Netflix. I gotta watch my shows. It could be as simple as you watching something like Fox News. I had a friend of mine say one day, he said, I had to actually get rid of my TV because I was obsessed with Fox News. I've had other people say that about CNN or MSNBC. They said I was obsessed, so I had to hold on to it. I held on to every word that came out of the media's mouth, right? Some people have to get rid of Facebook. Some people have to get rid of, of, of material things that they're holding on to. Maybe it's an, a hobby that you just love so much, it takes the place of everything good. It's robbing you of really your relationship with the Lord. The Bible says you need to starve those things, to kill those things. And, and that way you'll be right with the Lord. This rich young ruler, this was his struggle. This was his struggle. And it says he walked away sorrowful. 
walked away sorrowful because he couldn't do what the great savior of the world was telling him to do. He couldn't. He said, I just can't. And so he walked away. Oh, my friends, we need to be so careful in this life to not get caught up in the religious pitfalls that come. So you might be watching this today and saying, you know, you bring some great points up. There are a lot of false teaching, a lot of false teachers out there. And I need to be careful, make sure that I know what's right. And for you who need to be careful about that, I would tell you the way that you can um, get past false teachers and false teaching is to know the word of God. Know it, know it well. Know it so well that you can always recognize false teachers and false teaching. But you might be out there and you might say, you know, maybe. Maybe I don't really know Christ. Maybe I thought I did, or maybe I thought I had a relationship with him, but I've never truly given my life over to him. I've never surrendered. Oh, my friend, the great news for you today is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sinners, that whoever would put their faith and trust in him could be saved, that he'd save them, that if you confess with your mouth that, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you would be saved. The Bible says, call upon him and he will save you. So my friend, you don't have to worry or doubt your salvation. You can be right with the Lord God Almighty completely because he said that you can know for sure that you are one of his children. The Bible says these things are written that you may know that you are a child of the living God so that you can know that you have eternal life. And so if you're watching this and you don't know Christ, your Lord and Savior, here's what you can do. And it's just incredible. It's all about belief. It's all about faith. It's all about trust. And it's saying, Lord God, I know that I'm a sinner in need of fixing. I've got major problems and I need a cure. I've got a major sickness. I need the cure. So Lord God, I know that I'm sick. I know that I have problems. I know that I've sinned. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to be Lord of my life. I surrender my life to you. I promise you this. If you pray that prayer today, if you give your life over to Christ, he'll save you. He will save you. And he'll give you a new life. And so in just a moment, I want to pray for you. And in that moment, you might want to pray that prayer of salvation. Lord, come, be my Lord, be my Savior. I surrender my life to you. Pray that prayer. And then let us know that you've done that. Write us at Broadway Baptist Church. Let us know that you've given your life to Christ. Maybe you're one of those people who are watching this today and say, I, I know Christ, but I've put other things in, in place. I've fallen into this false teaching or I've, I've fallen into this more of this idol worship. I have things in my life that don't need to be first and foremost. They don't need to be the priority. Confess that. Let the Lord know. Tell the Lord he knows let him confess. The Bible tells us to confess. Confess that you have messed up in this area. And God says he is faithful and just and he'll forgive you of that sin and he'll put you in the right relationship with him once again. Oh, my friend, we don't ever want to be out of fellowship with the Lord God Almighty. And so may we today give all that we have to the Lord God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. This message is so appropriate for us today because there are false prophets, there's false teaching, and there's a lot of false security that's out there. And so, Lord, I pray, I pray for us that we would be people, people that are not caught up in the things of the world and not caught up in the, the religious systems that are that are teaching us the wrong things, but that we are we are always in the word of God and the word of God in us. And I pray that we think that way. We think the words of God. That'll protect us. Let us have the mind of Christ. And I pray for the one today that might be just unsure about their salvation. Your word says that you can be sure that if you would confess your sin, believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, confess Jesus as Lord, you'll be saved. So I pray for uh, that one or many who are listening to this today and saying, you know, I don't know Christ. I pray for them today that they surrender their life to Christ today. Father, I thank you that you give salvation the way that you give, you the way that you give it. It's free. It's a gift. We have to receive it. We have to take it. 
And that's the only way we can be in right relationship with you. It's not based on what we can do. It's based on what you've given. And it's based on us receiving. So Lord God, we love you. And we're, we're so thankful for all that we have. Continue to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ as we seek to follow you daily. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. It is so good to be with you today. And what a, what a wonderful and timely lesson that comes to us directly from Philippians chapter 3. Let's keep on reading the word of God. Let's keep on keeping on. Uh, we love you and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Sin runs deep, where sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ, and where you are, my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my whole best when I cannot stand and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus Jesus, you're my hope and stay.
Oh God, how I need you. Our prayer this week is that you, church, would remain in Christ, just as his word said, abide in me and I will abide in you. That's Jesus. So this week, abide in Jesus, trust in him, and declare every moment, Lord, I need you. God bless you. Take care.